but not as much of a question, we're done with this exercise, as the next system, where you do minus 6 and plus 4. Minus 6 and plus 4. So we're on to our last example, the groundbreaking example, the, the earth-shattering example. Minus 6 plus 4. Okay, let's see what happens here. So here we have minus 2 in both cases. Minus 2. Let's calculate the discriminant for minus, well, I'm not, I don't have it on the board, but you remember it's this number divided by 3 cubed. Minus 8. 4 minus 8. That's what we have under the square root. Minus 4. Minus 4. So I, you'll indulge me by letting me pull 2 from under the square root. So we have plus 2 times square root of minus 1. And here we have minus 2 times square root of minus 1. And so this is the sort of thing that's not unfamiliar, because solving any quadratic equation that doesn't have any roots would produce something like this, the square root of a negative number, at which point you just say that's an indication that there are no roots, and so our, our formula worked to perfection. In cases where there are roots, it delivered the roots. In cases where there are no roots, it gave us a clear indication that there are no roots. But, there is a root. Where is my equation? Here. This equation has a root of 2. Let's document that. 8 minus 12 plus 4. So there is a root. There is a root. So it's not the same situation that we encounter in quadratic equations where the square root of a negative number signals that there are no solutions. It looks like it, except there are solutions. So what do you do? Well, most people threw their hands up. But one person by the name of Bump Belly said, let's proceed as before. Now, I don't know what this is, but let's see if the algebraic framework holds up. Let's see if the algebraic framework holds up, and maybe something useful can be extracted from this. There is a lesson to be learned here. And also, what I talked about in the first lecture, that total severance and willingness to go there between algebra and geometry. Now clearly, Van Bailey was thinking, you know, my algebraic algorithm maybe will continue to work the same way. And while I cannot possibly have a physical interpretation for this, let me proceed algebraically and see what happens. So the word of algebra, the rules of algebra, that framework, has taken all a life of its own. And so some of the more daring mathematicians were beginning to ask themselves, well, what kind of life of its own does it have? And what sorts of things can we do with them? So, he just said, maybe this cubic root is also of the form A plus this symbol B. And if I were to cube this, According to the standard rules of algebra, I will get, well, let's see what sort of system this will yield. Very similar. Once again, we'll group this term and this term. So here we have a cubed minus 3ab squared. And this needs to equal minus 2. Okay? And now combining this and this, I have, so this matches up this, and then whatever multiplies the square root of negative 1 will have to match this. Okay, and that will be, and this needs to equal 2. So this is the system that it provides. And you know, if you bypass this step, 
then you're not really seeing the square roots of minus 1. It's kind of like the framework of we're kind of playing around with just pairs of numbers A and B. That's what we're kind of really doing, in a way. You can make the square root of minus 1 not appear. Okay, let's see if we can guess the solution. 1 and 1? A equals 1, B equals 1? 1 minus 3 equals minus 2. 3 minus 1 equals 2. 1 and 1. So then this was 1. Well, that's simple, right? 1 and 1. 1 plus square root of minus 1, Bob Deli said. That's kind of cool. So the meaning is lost, but the algebraic framework survives beautifully. Okay? Plus, once again, here, it would just have to be a minus 2 here, so all we have to do is flip the B. So 1 and minus 1 always seem to come in pairs like this. So 1 minus square root of minus 1. <laughs> and look, these terms cancel, equals 2. So this is a beautiful moment in the history of mathematics, where unequivocally, algebraic life is accepted on its own terms, devoid of geometric interpretation. The fact that complex numbers regain an entirely different geometric interpretation 300 years later is a different, is a different matter. Okay, so this is the germ of complex numbers. This is the moment they were born, when somebody had the courage to say, let's continue the exact same way we would have done with the square root of 5. And it just works algebraically, and so accept it. It's useful, so let's run with it. And then in the great Cardano described this in his book on algebra. Either this very example or an example like this. I think there was another famous cubic equation that had a 15 in it. I don't remember exactly. But when he came to this point, the book was written in Latin. He made a pun, which can be translated in one of two ways. One of them was that to go from, the, from here to the two, we have to dismiss our mental tortures. So dismissing our mental tortures, this equals this. And that's the more standard interpretation of what he was trying to say, but I think he was making a pun. Because the other interpretation is not dismissing mental tortures, but canceling the cross terms. Because canceling, dismissing and canceling are similar words, and cross and tortures were also similar words. So it's not clear what he meant. He probably was, was making a pun. But he presented it as, uh, you know, something that's worthy of mention, but not really mathematical. And then this attitude really continued through Descartes in the 17th century. And I don't know what Newton had to say about complex numbers, but there was much back and forth on whether or not these things are real until Euler came along and basically blew everybody out of the water. But what he did, more than anybody else, is just have so many methods at his disposal, and so many ideas, and trying these methods on so many different problems, that he could basically see the entire algebraic structure in his head, and the internal consistency of it all, even if he wasn't able to put it in words. When he put it in words, he just said these numbers don't exist, but they exist in our imagination. Literal, it's a literal quote. It's a quantity that does not exist, but that doesn't mean that it cannot exist in our imagination. And since it obeys all the algebraic rules, we're just going to use it. You know, but that, but you can see how that would happen, because look, we considered one example, and I think all of you, I can kind of tell by your body language, you're kind of saying, yeah, I can see that. Maybe I would have gone with it as well, even if it doesn't mean anything. So imagine going from one example that's so forceful and so convincing in a certain way to having considered thousands of examples and seeing it from every different point of view and having this 
incredibly broad view of what's going on. So it just, under Euler, it just started developing left and right and became really a complete, a complete field, a complete subject that was entirely internally consistent. So we're going to leave it off here because this, in my mind, justifies the development. And then next time, we're going to continue with just, you know, working with these numbers as if they exist and thinking about, does an inverse exist? Are they algebraically closed and so forth? But we will also point out the fact that some great mathematicians were very uncomfortable with it, with this, and so they proposed a way to formalize this in a way that would make everybody comfortable at the expense of taking the history and the intuition out of it. But they could afford that expense because they had the intuition and they knew the history. Right? It's just that we have forgotten some of it. And now that we've brought it back, I think we'll be comfortable with both approaches. Okay, I'll see you Monday. Enjoy your weekend. How do we do in time? Sorry? Really? Wow.